We're going to end our series in Genesis. We're going to be in Genesis 50, uh, verses 15 through 26. And we've been kind of doing a bigger overview, looking at the lives of different saints. And we're going to end Joseph's, we're not going to end Joseph's life. <laughs> he already de- he's, he's already dead. Uh, but we're going to come to the end of Joseph's life and see what God has for us there. So if you could open up to Genesis 50, verses 15 through 26, and listen along as I read the word of God. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said to one another, if Joseph is holding a grudge against us, he will certainly repay us for all the suffering we've caused. So they sent this message to Joseph. Before he died, your father gave a command. Say this to Joseph, please forgive your brother's transgression and their sin, the suffering they caused you. Therefore, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when their message came to him. His brothers also came to him, bowed down before him and said, we are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. Therefore, don't be afraid. I'll take care of you and your children. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph and his father's family remained in Egypt. Joseph lived 110 years. He saw Ephraim's sons to the third, uh, to the third generation. The sons of Manasseh's son, Machir, were recognized by Joseph. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will certainly come to your aid and bring you up from this land to the land he swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Joseph made the sons of Israel take an oath. When God comes to your aid, you are to carry my bones up from here. Joseph died at the age of 110. They embalmed him and placed him in a coffin in Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, would you please open our eyes to see Jesus, strengthen our hearts to believe in him, and strengthen our wills to follow him wherever he leads us today. We pray this in his holy name. Amen. Can you trust God? Yes. Amen. We'll get there. Uh, can you trust him in your past? Can you trust him with your future? Can you trust him in death? Can you trust him in failures with your circumstances, your marriage, your singleness? Can you trust God? Satan, he asked the world's first question. He introduced the first seed of doubt into God's beautiful garden. He went up to Eve and he said, did God really say you shouldn't eat from any of the trees in the garden? And this question, can you trust God, has kind of worked its way into humanity's soul. Satan really wasn't asking a question. He was making a statement. He was saying, God is holding out on you, Eve. God doesn't know what he's doing. And so Adam and Eve gave into the temptation to not trust God, but to trust their own wisdom. And we followed suit. We've been going through the book of Genesis And Genesis doesn't end with a happily ever after. The book starts with expectancy, it kind of ends with disappointment. It starts in Eden, it ends in Egypt. It starts with creation, and the last word is a coffin. Genesis is chapter one of God's huge story, and Exodus is chapter two. And in chapter two, things don't look any better. For 400 years, the opening of chapter two, for 400 years, God's people are slaves in Egypt. <laughs> Yet the end of Genesis isn't all just doom and gloom. There is a bright spot, and that bright spot is Joseph. Joseph is a happy anomaly in this book. Over and over again in Genesis, with with a few exceptions, people, sinners and saints, they take things into their own hands and they don't trust God. But Joseph, from pretty much the beginning towards the end of his life, he gives himself wholeheartedly to God. He believes in him fully. This gives us hope that Satan's whisper won't always win. It's possible to trust the creator in a cursed world. 
So the life of Joseph teaches us a core message in Genesis. Here, here's the heart of this last passage. You can trust God's promises because of his providence. And I'm going to trust his providence with this stand. But you can trust God's promises because of his providence. And if you don't know what providence is, we're going to unpack that as we go. And we're going to look at this passage in two perspectives, trusting God's providence, trusting God's promises. So let's look at verses 15 through 21 together. Joseph's brothers come to him because their dad is dead. Jacob is dead. And if you've been tracking with this story, many, many, many years ago, out of jealousy, Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. And Joseph forgave them when they were reunited, and it had been some years, but they were wondering, was Joseph just putting on a show of forgiveness? Now that dad is gone, he doesn't have to pretend anymore. And so they kind of forged this letter. They're still kind of grimy brothers. They forged this letter. They, they send it on the way to Joseph. And it's a false letter from their now dead dad that basically says, Joseph, please forgive, forgive the boys. And when Joseph reads this letter, we have an unexpected reaction. Joseph weeps. He seems grieved that they don't receive his forgiveness as genuine. He's cut to the heart that his brothers are still walking on eggshells around him. And Joseph, even in his sadness, he responds to his brothers with a deep gentleness. He responds with humility, gentleness. If you look at verse 19, he says, am I in the place of God? Joseph knows his rightful place. He knows God is on his throne and Joseph is not. And all throughout the story of Joseph, he's relying on the presence of God. It was God's presence that caused Joseph to flee temptation from Potiphar's wife. It was God's presence that gave Joseph hope in the prison. And now it's God's presence that keeps Joseph from being harsh with his brothers. And he goes on to point God's providence in his whole story. He says in verse 20, you planned evil against me. But God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. If you notice what Joseph is doing, he's not glossing over what they did. He's not saying, oh, it's all right. It's all right, guys. We're all good. No, he says, what you planned for evil, that was actually wrong. That was evil. God intended that for good. In jealousy, Joseph's brothers, they sent him away. But in God's providence, he sent Joseph ahead ahead of his brothers, ahead of the famine, to prepare the world for the 70-year famine that was to come. And what Joseph's brothers planned for evil, God planned for good, even towards, good towards his brothers. And we see this same providence at play at the cross of Christ. God turned the greatest evil, the death of his son, into the greatest good, the salvation of the world. God used the death of Jesus to bring life. He used the shame of Jesus to bring us honor. He used the wounds of Jesus to bring us healing. And he used the suffering of Jesus to bring him glory. What Satan and evil men meant for evil, God meant for good. So this is the, the beauty of God's providence. And I want to stop here because we don't use providence every day. So I want to dwell on what that is for a moment. God's providence simply means that God controls all things according to his wisdom. God is controlling all things according to his own wisdom. And he's in control because he made all things, he knows all things, and he rules all things. And this is really good news for us. Because the one who's in the control box is a loving father, a wise father. God's providence isn't kind of deism or fatalism. You might hear this, you might even say this, I do sometimes, well, it is what it is, or, well, everything happens for a reason. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about God's providence. His providence is deeply personal. It's the creator God who is ruling over everything to show off his beauty, his wisdom, his strength, and to call us into it. 
But we should be careful here. Though we know kind of the destination of God's providence, okay? So if we look at Revelation, if we look elsewhere in the New Testament, it says the big picture is God is working all things for his glory and for our happiness, right? We know the big picture. We don't know all the twists and turns that providence takes. God's providence is mysterious. So it's kind of like if you set out a puzzle, on the cover you have the finished product of the puzzle, what it should look like at the end. But when you dump that puzzle out, you have no idea how all those pieces are going to fit. And that's how it is with God's providence. He gives us this beautiful picture and revelation of people from all nations worshiping the king, filled with more joy than they could contain. That's the picture on the cover. But we don't know how all the pieces are going to shape up. So why does God kind of let us in, in his, on his secret? Why does he come up by us and say, okay, this is all going to head towards my glory and your joy? Well, it's not for debates. And maybe, maybe you come from a church culture where people are always banging their heads over. Uh, are people fully responsible or is God totally sovereign? Maybe you're online arguing these things. But the Bible holds us in this tension, this beautiful tension. The Bible teaches that all of us humans are fully responsible for our actions. And it simultaneously teaches that God is in wise control of all things. And that's kind of where we sit in that tension. And God gives us this doctrine of providence, not for debate, but that we would be more humble, that we would be comforted, and that we would be transformed by the grace of God. So God's providence humbles us. It shows us that he's in control and we're not. God's providence, it comforts us because our loving Father is in control. If you think about it, uh, a road trip, you know, if you have little kids, a road trip experience is totally different for the parent than it is for the toddler, right? The toddler, they might complain, but they have like, you know, this endless train of snacks coming their way. You know, if they poop, they just start screaming, get it changed. It's an it's a easy trip. But for the parent who's, who's leading that, that road trip, they're thinking about maps, gas, food, toll booths. They're taking, they're, they have the whole trip under control. And for us, we are that toddler in the back seat. We don't even have a second thought of all these things that God is doing to, to lead us on our journey. And so we all could take a deep breath because of God's providence. And God's providence also, it transforms our hearts to be a blessing towards others. If we know that the big picture of what God is doing is that he's blessing us and he's calling us to be a blessing, how can we curse our neighbor? How can we even call ourselves Christians if we're not bent on blessing our neighbors? And here we see in Joseph's story that providence shapes his heart. Look at verse 21. In verse 20, he says, what you plan for evil, God planned for good. Therefore, don't be afraid. I'll take care of you and your children. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. If you notice the therefore there, he's saying, because God is in control of good and evil, I'm not going to take vengeance. Because God is set on blessing the nations, I'm going to seek to bless you, even my broken brothers. And I love this. In Joseph's response to his brothers, who are truly guilty, we have a window into the heart of Jesus. Jesus is that merciful, forgiving, kind brother. He is forgiving towards those who have betrayed him and done evil towards him. And this is the reception that you could expect when you come to Jesus. Don't be afraid. I forgive you. I'll take care of you. And this is good news for you if, if you're considering following Jesus. This is kind of a pattern um, that we see over and over again. So if you're, if you're not a Christian yet and you're thinking about what it would look like to follow Jesus, there's going to come a time when you realize that your whole life is, has been spent in rebellion to your maker. And it's just going to sit heavy on you. And often when we feel that weight, we often call that conviction, when you feel that weight, that my whole life has been against Jesus, the one who made me and loved me, Kind of the second emotion that comes up behind guilt is fear. You begin to think, will he receive me if I come to him? You're afraid that he'll uh, hold a grudge against you 
or turn you away. But in the response of Jesus, we see the heart, a response of Joseph, we see the heart of Jesus. Jesus, in the Gospel of John, he promises not to turn away anyone who comes to him. So if you're being held back by fear today and saying, okay, I'm convinced that Jesus is real, and I'm convinced I need him, but I'm afraid that he won't receive me, go to him today. Hold on to that promise. And and this is good news, too, for, for Christians who doubt the love of Jesus. Think about this. Joseph's brothers had been with him maybe 12, 13 years at this point. They had already reconciled with Joseph. He already revealed himself to them, cried. He said he wept on their neck. He forgave them. He gave them land. He gave them livestock. And after all these years, these brothers don't trust his forgiveness. Their consciences still haunted them. And you might feel like that as a Christian. You've been walking with Jesus for years. And, and you still don't trust his heart to forgive you. You think he's holding a grudge towards you. Well, this unbelief made Joseph weep. And it makes Jesus weep and grieve. Because he's so willing. He's eager to forgive you, to take care of you, to draw you in. So, so I, just, I just plead with you, if you're a Christian here, and you're just holding on to a sin... And you're you're scared out of your mind that Jesus will reject you if you open up to him. Come to him today. Now, this this verse, what you intended for evil, God intended for good, is one of the key verses on God's providence uh, and evil in the Bible. And it has kind of a New Testament counterpoint. We could pull up uh, Romans 8, 28 and 29. You're probably familiar with this. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So if you've been around the church, you've been a Christian for a minute, you probably have Romans 8.28 in the tool belt or in the holster for any, any counseling situations. If you have a brother, a sister, a kid who's going through a hard time, you're like right there with Romans 8.28. Uh, but I want to I think through this a little bit as we're called to counsel one another as a church. Um, Romans 8.28 is a really good verse to have and to share with someone who's suffering. It's, it's a fitting verse, but we could use it in the wrong way. So if I need a you know, hammer down a nail, the right tool is a hammer. So I could have the right tool and use it in a wrong way if I turn around and try to hack at it with the claw. You know, imagine me trying to take the claw of the hammer, hitting down a nail. You're going to create a lot of damage. And I'm afraid this verse can be used, even though it's a fitting verse for people who are suffering, it could be used in a damaging way. So let's talk for a second on how not to apply Romans 8, 28. Here's two ways not to apply all things work for good. First is the magical incantation. So, you, you have, have this tool here. You say Romans 8, 28, maybe like Harry Potter with a wand. And you expect the person who's suffering to be like, you're right. All things are for good. Let's go out for lunch. And when the person doesn't respond like that, you grow impatient. You say, or maybe you start to question that person's faith. Say, well, they're really not trusting God. When we apply Romans 8, 28, like a magical incantation, just waiting for people to snap out of it. We're using the right tool in a wrong way. One other way to do that is by misdefining good. You may have heard things like this. You know, if you're disappointed, you didn't get the job you wanted. Maybe a well-meaning brother or sister has said, well, if God closes a door, he'll surely open a window. You know what? You didn't get that job because God has a better job for you out there. Well, maybe he does and maybe he doesn't. The good in Genesis 50 is the survival of many nations. And the good in Romans 8.28 is spelled out in Romans 8.29. We know that God works all things together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those four, those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. The good that God is working towards in your life through all the mess, through all the suffering and the sin is conformity to Christ, to becoming more like Jesus. 
Not that you'd get the better job or the better boyfriend or girlfriend, but becoming more and more like Jesus and getting closer and closer to him in your walk. So we could use this verse, God's providence, as kind of a magical incantation, or we could misdefine the good and kind of hold out false promises for people. But here's a couple ways I commend to you to kind of apply this truth as you're sharing with someone who's suffering. Apply this truth with compassion and patience. The God of providence, the Son of God, Jesus, came down. He took on flesh and he cried with people. He suffered with people. He got sick with people. If anyone has a right to beat us over the head with providence and say, cheer up, God is doing something amazing in our life, it would be Jesus. But he doesn't come down with a bat, a Romans 8.28 bat. He comes down first to sit with sinners and sufferers, to eat with them, to get to know them. So we apply this with compassion and patience. And finally, we apply it with the long view of ultimate good. God is using our suffering, this momentary affliction, to prepare for us a weight of glory that is coming. So yes, God is using every single thing the good, the bad, the ugly in your life, Christian, for good. And it's the long game view of good. And so God's providence should stoke our hope for the future, our hope of heaven, more than it stokes our hope for glory in this life. So when we're counseling each other with, you know, God is working all things for the good of those who love him, what we're doing in that moment is we're holding out a promise to someone and saying, here's a promise for God, from God. But how can we be sure we could trust God's promises? We're going back to that question. Can we trust God? Well, in this final passage of Genesis, we see that Joseph trusts God's promises fully, even on the deathbed. And this passage shows precisely that God, because of God's providence, we could trust his promises. So let's see how this works. Let's look at trusting God's promises in verses 22 through 26. Joseph and his father's family remain in Egypt. Joseph lived 110 years. He saw Ephraim's sons to the third generation. The sons of Manasseh's son, Machir, were recognized by Joseph. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will certainly come to your aid and bring you up from this land to the land he swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Joseph made the sons of Israel take an oath. He said, when God comes to your aid, you are to carry my bones up from here. Joseph died at the age of 110. They embalmed him and placed him in a coffin in Egypt. So Joseph trusts God's providence. Now he trusted his pro promises at the end. So Joseph finishes his, his life with confidence. And how you finish your walk with Jesus matters. And the key to his confidence in all of this is that Joseph was holding on to specific promises that he had from God. So Joseph's great, 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 whatever, grandfather got a promise from God saying, I'm going to bless you with my presence. I'm going to give you a huge family, people, and I'm going to give you a place, land, this promised land, Canaan. And Joseph was holding on to this rock solid promise of God because right now on his deathbed, he's not in that promised land. He's in Egypt. And he's holding on to this specific promise. And he's a model for us here. Let's not hold on to vague ideas of who God is. Let's hold on to specific promises that he gives us. God is so kind. He's so loving. He gives us promises for every single season of life. Whether you're afraid or tempted or discouraged or tired, there's a promise for you to hold on to. And so here, Joseph is holding on to the promise. And he prophesies. In verse 24, he says, I'm about to die, but God will certainly come to your aid and bring you up from this land to the land he swore to give to Abraham. So if you're familiar with the Bible story or you are familiar with the pr Prince of Egypt, by the way, excellent soundtrack. But you know that this is what exactly, this is exactly what God does. 400 years later, God comes to the aid of the Israelites and he takes them up out of slavery and leads them out of Egypt into the promised land. Joseph's confidence, this like fired me up. I'm studying this saying, let's go. 
His confidence at the end of his life is inspiring. Imagine, Satan must have been whispering in his ear, where is your God now, Joseph? You're dying in a foreign land. God hasn't given you what he promised. You're not in the promised land. In Joseph's response, he doesn't even fight Satan. He just tells his brothers confidently, God will come to our aid. And when he does, bring my bones back home. The Christian life ends in expectation and not despair. The key question, though, is how did Joseph get that confidence on his deathbed? How did Joseph get that sureness in his bones that God indeed is going to keep his promise? Well, Joseph put two and two together. He said, God has promised something, promises. God is in control of all things, providence. Therefore, God will fulfill his promise. And so he tells his brothers, take my bones out of here. And Hebrews eleven twenty two 22 says, by faith, Joseph, as he was nearing the end of his life, mentioned the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions concerning his bones. He did this by faith. By faith in what? The promises and providence of God. So Joseph dies. He's embalmed. So he's like one of two guys in the Bible to be mummified. He gets mummified in the Egyptian custom, but his heart fully belongs to God. And 400 years later, God would raise up a man named Moses to deliver the Israelites from Egypt. And they would travel to the promised land. It was on this, on this journey in the desert as they're leaving Egypt, going to the promised land, that Moses actually started writing Genesis. This is the first audience. And on his way out, Moses is carrying something with him. He's carrying that box of bones that carried Joseph bones. Check this out. Uh, we can pull this up. Exodus 13, verse 18 says this. This is talking about the Exodus. And the Israelites left the land of Egypt in battle formation. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. That's 400 years later. Because Joseph had made the Israelites swear a solemn oath saying, God will certainly come to your aid. Then you must take my bones with you from this place. When Israel, they, they eventually left Egypt, Moses, he had this, this, these bones of Joseph. They're going to the promised land. And on the way to the promised land, they're getting right up to the edge of Canaan and they see these giants in the land. And there's like, there is no way we are going in that land. We're going to get crushed. And so God, in discipline, he says, okay, the generation that said that, you guys are going to wander the desert and you're, gonna, you're all going to die off. And your children, the little ones around you, are going to be the ones to crush those giants. And all along that way, those 40 years, as these people were dying off in the wilderness, there was that box of bones. Joseph, though he had been dead 400 years, his bones were still preaching and testifying to the, the Israelites, saying, God, in his providence, will fulfill his promises. Go and get them. And so the life and death of Joseph, today, they preach a continuous sermon. It's a one-line sermon. Come what may, you can trust in God. He preached it to Israel in the desert. When you are wandering in the wilderness on the way home, you can trust in God. When you face giants in battle, you can trust God. And Joseph, those, those bones are still preaching to us today. When you feel tempted, you can trust God. When you really screw up, you can trust God. When you are betrayed by friends, you can trust God. When you enter your first day of high school, you can trust God. When you're dropped off at college, you can trust God. When you're weighed down by unmet desires, you can trust God. When you feel stuck at a dead end job, you can trust God. When you struggle with infertility, you can trust God. When postpartum depression comes, you can trust God. When marriage gets hard, you can trust God. When the cancer diagnosis comes, you can trust God. When you prepare for surgery, you can trust God. When you lose your job, you can trust God. When you have a midlife crisis, you can trust God. When friends and family start dying, you can trust God. And when you come to your final breath, 
You can trust God. You could trust him because he made you. You can trust him because he knows you fully and loves you fully. And you could trust him because in love, he sent his son to rescue you from death, to call you from running away from him. <clears throat> Jesus is the good shepherd. He's leading us back home to the true promised land. He is with you. He is for you. He forgives you. He comforts you. So church, you can trust God's promises because of his providence.